we already discussed physical conversion and combustion. Basically, physical conversion product is burnt. We also discussed high temperature gasification and carbonization in the last class. Okay? So today, we will be discussing flash pyrolysis, supercritical water gasification, direct liquefaction, and hydrothermal carbonization. Okay? Then, we would like to start from the supercritical water gasification because it is good example of hydrothermal conversion. Okay. So supercritical water gasification is to gasify biomass in hot compressed water. That hot compressed water is called supercritical water. Supercritical water. But what is supercritical water exactly? Let's discuss from that. Maybe you have seen phase diagram of water. This side is temperature. Here is pressure. And water can take various forms depending on temperature and pressure. Something like this. You have, what, you have seen this figure, right? Yes. yes. In high school, maybe you have learned. Under atmospheric pressure, which is around 0 0.1 megapascal, at very low temperature, water is taking the form of solid. What do you call this solid? Ice. Yes, so it's ice here. When you heat it up, it melts at what temperature? One hundred? Zero. You know, you need a unit. Zero Kelvin? Yes, zero Celsius. Very good. And then it becomes liquid water. Liquid water is further heated and it is changed into gas. What do you call this water gas? Steam. Steam, very good. At what temperature does this? take place. Yes, very good, 100 Celsius. And you have only one point where all ice and liquid and steam can coexist. What do you call this point? Triple point, yes. So this is a triple point. OK. So here, all the three phases can coexist. But on the lines, only two phases can coexist. So on this line, liquid and gas can coexist. And the temperature corresponds to the boiling point. This line, however, ends at some point. This point 
is called critical point. But why does this line end? That's what we have to know. We all know that water boils at 100 centimeters, right? But it is further 0 0.1 megapascal. When you go to lower pressure, the boiling point goes down. For example, when you go to high mountain, the pressure is low. The water boils at low temperature. So for example, when you cook rice at the top of the mountain, you can't cook it well because boiling water has low temperature. On the other hand, when you go to high pressure, the boiling point goes up. So for example, when you are deep in the sea, high pressure by seawater is, exists. And then the boiling does not take place at 100 centimeters, at much higher temperature. For example, when you go to 1 megapascal, 100 megapascal, and 10 megapascal, then temperature goes higher and higher and higher for the boiling point. The point is, what is the volume expansion by boiling? When you have atmospheric pressure water, when it boils, it expands to 1,600 times. This small amount of water becomes 1,600 times in volume for st as steam. But when you go to higher pressure, for example, one megapascal, it expands, but water volume does not change. But steam is pressurized. So you can't go 1,600, but only 160 times, 160 times. It's around 180 centigrade. And when you go to 10 megapascal, 10 megapascal, it is only 12 times. So at atmospheric pressure, it's 1,600. One megapascal, 160. 10 megapascal, 12. And smaller, smaller, smaller. And finally, at pressure of 22.1 megapascal. The volume of steam and volume of water becomes the same. Then you can't distinguish the liquid water and the gas water anymore. Then there's no more boiling above this pressure. So the line ends here. Here, you can distinguish liquid and gas. But the property becomes closer and closer, and finally becomes the same at this point. The corresponding point for temperature is 374 centigrade. When the temperature and the pressure are both above this point, which is in the range of here. This water is called supercritical. And this supercritical water can be used for the conversion of biomass. Why can we use supercritical water for conversion by mass? It is because supercritical water is very reactive. Very, very reactive. You know why chemical reaction takes place? Chemical reaction takes place 
because molecules and molecules collide with high energy so that the combination of atoms changes. Then you have completely different products. In high temperature region, water has high energy. So it can attack biomass molecule with the high energy so that it, it can react. Also, the high pressure results in large amount of water molecules in specific volume. Then it collides with much higher frequency. So when you put biomass in supercritical water, water molecule attacks biomass rapidly with sufficient energy, with frequency, and then it can be decomposed smaller and smaller and smaller molecules. Finally to the gas. That is supercritical water gasification. So when you put biomass in the hot compressed water, supercritical water, it can be rapidly decomposed into combustible gas. Well, when you are talking about this kind of technology, why do we want to use supercritical water gasification? It is because we can use wet biomass. If you have wood, for example, and want to get gas, we have high temperature gasification. We already discussed this technology. It's very easy. You can get large amount of gas with high efficiency. We don't have to think about pressurization and difficult things. But when you have wet biomass, like cattle manure, like chicken manure, like food waste, or sweat sludge, it has large amount of water, and you can't use this technology. Then, supercritical water gasification can be the possibility. But when you're talking about wet biomass, you can also convert it with another technology, which is biomethanation. We have not discussed this in detail, but when you have wet biomass, and put it in the place where no air exists. The biomass gets rotten and decomposed by the help of microorganisms. When you put it in the air, microorganisms decompose it and produce water and carbon dioxide. But when there's no air, another microorganism works and it produces carbon dioxide, methane. This is a methane fermentation. So you can use methane fermentation too. But there are two problems of methane fermentation. Of course, it is already commercialized, but it is not always so easy. The first problem about biomethanation is that it is very slow. You know, microorganisms work rather slowly. So when you want to complete methane fermentation, it takes usually one week to two weeks, which means if you have this amount of biomass every day, you have to keep it, you have to have a reactor for the methane fermentation for 14 of them. So methane fermentation, very, very big reactor. When you visit them, you find a big reactor. Whoa. Methane fermentation, very slow. And that results in a very big reactor. On the other hand, Supercritical water gasification. Water attacks biomass rapidly, decomposes rapidly. It takes in five minutes. 
So 14 days, five minutes. The size of the reaction is completely different, right? Only five minutes. So supercritical gasification does not require this big reaction, but it can be done only this. Way. The second problem is methane fermentation. Second problem is that it is incomplete. You know, it is basically microorganism eating the feedstock. But because they are microorganisms, they eat only what they can eat. What they can't eat is left behind and comes out from the reactor as residue. So after methane fermentation, you get very high BOD product which again has to be treated. And what they do is to produce compost. But do you know how long it takes for compost to be produced? Months. Yeah, several months. Very good. So which means that you have to have month volume or places to produce compost. So it's a very, very big problem, especially like the country like Japan, because we don't have land. <laughs> so when you go to the methane fermentation factory, you find the methane fermentation reactor, wow. And then, see, large area of composting. So it's a very big problem about methane fermentation. However, supercritical gasification. Water attacks biomass without thinking if it can eat or not. So everything can be decomposed and almost complete conversion, gasification, is achieved. After supercritical water, when you apply very good condition, clear water coming out. So this technology can be used in place of methane fermentation. Very useful technology. When I explain this technology to everyone. There's sometimes a question from the audience. You know, high temperature, high pressure water requires energy to be produced. Then even if you get biomass gasification energy, you may be using more energy to produce high temperature, high pressure water. Then, in total, you are using energy. You are not producing energy. It's the case. <laughs> then why are we doing this? But everyone, when we set up the reactor, actually what we do is something like this. We have biomass in water, suspended. But what biomass? Like slurry. When you have a mania, when you have sweet slurry, you see that it is something like a paste with large amount of water, and it is fed with a high pressure pump. And then, high pressure is achieved, high pressure. What we need is heat. So we heat it. To achieve high temperature. And then you send it to the reactor. In the reactor, it is high pressure and high temperature and it's super quick water. Here, water attacks biomass and completely gas fight. The point is after that, you have gas and water coming out, but what is the temperature? High temperature, 6,000 centigrade, just the same as in the reactor. So it has heat. 
So we can take heat from here and then give it to here. For this purpose, we have the apparatus, which is called heat exchanger. Then the temperature is very low. Pressure is still high. Then what we have, something like pressure, depressurization system. And we get atmospheric pressure, room temperature, gas, and water. When you look at the system, the energy we are putting in is biomass energy. Heat is recovered inside, so we don't put heat from outside. And what we get is only gas. So which means we don't have to add large amount of heat from outside. So high temperature, high pressure is not a problem after all. Of course. Heat exchanger does not have 100% conversion efficiency. But efficiency higher than 90% is easily achieved, even under this pressure and for this high temperature. Efficiency can be higher than 90%. And also, you might be thinking, what about pressurization energy? Yes, we need high pressure. When electricity is applied to the high pressure pump. But do you know how much energy required for pressurization? It is pressure times volume. When you pressurize water, even if you pressurize, water volume doesn't change. So pressure times volume, because volume changes very small, is very small. So usually, compared to the energy that biomass have, the energy required for pressurization is around 5. And of course, because this is not 100%, you have to add some heat from outside. But this can be something like 10. So to get this energy as gas product, to get 100, we use only 115. The efficiency is very high. So basically, we are producing energy, not consuming in total. So this is the supercritical water gasification. Maybe you're wondering, what is the gas? The main component of supercritical water gas is CO2. CH4 and H2. Maybe you're not, you are not from the chemistry, but CO2 is what? Carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide. CH4 is what? Methane. Methane. Yeah. H2 is what? Hydrogen. Hydrogen, yes. And among them, you can burn methane and hydrogen. So although there are some carbon dioxide, this is combustible gas. Where I say in this way, sometimes I get a question. It produces carbon dioxide. It's not good. But please think in this way. This carbon dioxide comes from where? It originally comes from biomass. Biomass has carbon inside, and then it is converted into these gases. 
maybe you are releasing some CO2 here, and after burning carbon methane, you get carbon dioxide too. But these carbon dioxide are absorbed when you grow the biomass. And then this biomass is eaten by cow. You get manure. And then you use this for the supercritical water gasification again to get this gas. So again, here is the carbon cycle. No increase of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. So this technology is, again, carbon neutral. Even if you have carbon dioxide emitted here, it can be recyc recycled. So this is what is called supercritical water gasification. This supercritical water gasification is also reaction. So sometimes we want to add some material to enhance the reaction rate. This kind of material is called catalyst. Because it's high temperature, high pressure, what we can use is also limited. Sometimes they use metal catalyst, like nickel, rhodium, or other kind of precious metals. Then you can run the reaction at lower temperature, like 400 centigrade or something. Unfortunately, the deactivation of this catalyst takes place rapidly. So metal catalyst is very effective, but can be deteriorated at once. Another kind of catalyst which, runs, which is used for high temperature, like 600, is carbon, like activated carbon. It is known that active carbon can enhance the gasification. Also, some people use it, alkali. When you mix alkali, that reaction is also enhanced. But for the case of alkali, it is dissolved in the water, and you can't recover it. That's the problem. So you can use this kind, these kind of catalysts for the supercritical water gasification. Now, when you want to develop some technologies, you first start from the laboratory scale. Very small one, maybe some scale like this, and then test if the reaction takes place. When you find it works, you go to the, what is called bench scale, rather big scale. And if it works well, you go to the bigger scale, pilot. When you finish pilot, you go to much bigger one, demonstration. And then finally, you go to the commercialized scale. So <coughs> lab scale, bench scale, and then pilot, demonstration, and then commercialize. Supercritical water gasification has been studied in the lab scale. Bench scale was also successful. And now it is at the stage of pilot scale. There are, well, there were three pilot scales in the world. One is in United States, Pacific Northwest Laboratory, 0 0.6 ton per day. Another one is in Germany, Karlsruhe Research Center, 2.4 ton per day. This is USA, this is Germany. The last one, 2.4. The last one is here in Japan, one ton per day in Higashi Hiroshima. Not Hiroshima University, but in the science park over there, in the Chugoku Electric Company. We were collaborating, and we had this plan. Because the project is end, it ended, and the apparatus was old, 
we already took it away. <laughs> but we had this in Japan. I heard that uh, another one was built in Netherlands, but I have not visited and I do not know detail. And we are now planning to go to the demonstrate and commercialize this. So unfortunately, this technology is good, but has not been commercialized. It is because this process is still kind of expensive. High temperature, high pressure. So we have to think of something about that. And also, when you operate it, of course we can gas fight, but we also produce some other compound like tar or char. So we have to get rid of that. So this kind of technology development is still going on, but it can solve the problem of methane fermentation, and hopefully we can use this technology in the future. Okay, so this is the basic idea of the supercritical water gasification. It requires rather high temperature. Because critical temperature of water is 374, it has to go to higher than this temperature. For the metal catalyst, I already told you, 410 degrees. But reaction usually is not complete because catalyst gets bad. Then we also go to high temperature, like 600. Under high pressure, like 25 megapascal. So reaction area is something like here in supercritical water gasification. When water is not supercritical, the water is called subcritical water. Subcritical water is not, as, is not so reactive as supercritical water, but still it is reactive. So you can use subcritical water for another treatment. When the temperature is lower, something like 300 or 350 centigrade, so this is supercritical water, but here, subcritical, you can get, not gas, but oil. When your temperature is lower, you get oil instead of gas. This technology to get oil is called direct liquefaction. This direct liquefaction can produce oil rather easily from wet biomass. Because you can use something like this again. You can just send it to the reactor at low temperature, and you can get something coming out. And when you put the effluent in the place, in the bottle for a long time, you get two phases, oil and water. You can just take oil phase and use it for fuel. So that's why direct liquefaction was interested in. You can get oil easily from the wet biomass, like sweet sweat and catrimonia or food waste. This direct liquefaction has been studied in many countries. In Japan, we use sweet sweat our feedstock and try to achieve this technology. In the years of 1980s or 70s, it was called the Project Aqua Renaissance, and they fed sweet sludge into the high temperature, high pressure reactor, and water all automatically comes together with the sweet sludge, and they try to get they were successful, yes. And they could use a continuous reactor. Sometimes they had a problem of the plugging. But anyway, you, they could get oil. 
Another example is in Netherlands. They dig the hole underground and fed feedstock. I thought there was food waste. And then heated it underground and then obtained oil. So this kind of approach has been made. Unfortunately, this technology has not been commercialized yet too. It has been shown that you can get oil. That oil has a heating value, something like heavy oil. So maybe 30, 35 megajoules per kilogram. So it's OK. But the problem is, first of all, again, high temperature, high pressure results in high cost. So product oil is too expensive. Also, the product oil is very dark colored, very heavy oil. So of course, you can't put it into the engine. And you can buy it in the big burner, maybe, but it's not suitable for the usual one. And often it comes with the water, rather high moisture content in the oil. So it is not so easy to use. And also, another point is that because it is, yeah, the reaction is not complete. Supercritical water gasification, everything becomes gas. It's easy, right? But here, you are stopping the reaction in the middle. So it is getting decomposed, decomposed, and you stop it before it goes all the way to gas. So there are various, various kinds of products. Some of them becomes oil, but the others left in the liquid phase. So if after you get the oil, you have very dirty water, effluent. You have to get rid of it somehow. And that's a problem. You can't do usual treatment so much because it's already thermally treated. Some stable compound has been produced. So this is kind of a challenge. Recently, Tsukuba University is interested in this technology and is trying to gas, no, or get oil from microalgae. Microalgae, as you know, can be cultivated in the reactor rapidly. And some microorganisms have oil inside. So when you treat microorganisms in this kind of technology, you can decompose the cell, you can get oil coming out. Also, you are converting part of the cell into oil, too. So the technology is still under research. But commercialization is something we have to wait. OK. Now, when temperature is much lower, like 200, 250, or 300. So this is the direct liquefaction. Much lower temperature, but not 100. Hmm. At least maybe 200. We do not get oil, but we get cha. Cha in water. So what we do is to treat it under pressure at rather low temperature, but rather longer time. And then you are converting biomass into solid charcoal in pressurized hot water. This technology is called Hydrothermal carbonization. This is a technology which is interesting recently. Actually, the, this technology, this phenomenon has been known, and in the 
1990s, there are some companies trying to hide, uh, trying to employ this technology to get water with suspended carbon fuel. This suspended carbon water can be used as fuel instead of, they use instead of oil. This was called slurry fuel. And at the beginning, they were using, you are, they are trying to use this slurry fuel as a fuel. At the time, there was technology called coal water mixture which is called CWM. What they did for this technology was to pulverize coal into powder and mix it with water. And of course, coal and water are hydrophobic and hydrophilic. They do not suspend well, so they added some surfactant. And they suspended coal successfully in the water and used it as a fuel in place of oil. As you know, we had a bad time in the oil crisis in 1970s. And then they te developed this technology so that even when you do not have oil, you can have something else, which is from coal. They knew the, this technology, so they also thought that if we can produce carbon from biomass in water, you can get something like this. So they wanted to get a solar fuel from hydrothermal carbonization. However, again, this has not been commercialized. But these days, another idea is used for this technology. In these maybe five years or something, more and more interest is being attracted to this technology. So what they do is also treat biomass in hot compressed water, not high temperature, longer time, produce char, and then they filtrate. And then get this filtrated char. And then you dry it and use it fuel. Well, if you can remove water easily, you don't have to think about all this kind of technology. The reason why we have to use this kind of technology is because wet biomass is not easy to separate water from it. So even if you have wet biomass, like slurry, like cattle manure, like food waste, like sweet sludge, you can separate water in this way. But when you carbonize it, when you carbonize it, it can be easily separated from water. And then you can dry, it, dry it some left water and then get fuel. This kind of approach is now being studied all over the world. The reason why carbonization helps to remove water is because when you have biomass, usually it has cells. Biomass you know, living creatures made up of cells, right? So when you have microalgae, for example, each microalgae has a cell. When you have cattle manure, manure, what do you know what manure is? One third is food waste. One third is the cell from the gut cell. Another one third is the gut flora, which is also microorganism. So it has cells. When you have food waste, food is vegetable, again, cell. And this cell contains water, and we can separate water from the cell. Also, this compound is very hydrophilic. So it is at attracts water, and we can separate water each. That's why. We can't dry wet biomass easily, and we have to think about this kind of technology. But once, once you carbonize this, 
what happens? When you heat it, the cell is decomposed. All the water inside comes out. And when you carbonize it, hydrophilic functional group is converted into hydrophobic one. So it easily releases water. So once you treat it in hot compressed water, the water separation is much easier. And then you can get this fuel. Because in this case, they, want, they are going to get solid products. They call this hydro char. And they are trying to use this for energy resources. This is the hydrothermal carbonization technology. Again, this technology has not been commercialized yet. They show that they can apply this technology to various feedstocks. And they can get this hydrochar, and they, can ma they have measured the heating value, which is almost the same as charcoal. The point is, how do you use this? Solid fuel is not so easy to use compared to gas and liquid. What kind of fuel do you use in your house? It's a city gas, propane gas, right? What kind of fuel do you use for the car? It's a liquid, right? Solid fuel is not so easy. So the utilization of this product is one of the problems. And again, because this temperature is very low, reaction can never be complete. So you have char, but also you have liquid fat contaminated with a large amount of organics. And again, you have to get rid of it. What do you do? Again, that can be problem. So there are some problems, and uh, that is under development right now. I believe it is still on the stage of a bench or maybe some pilot, I don't know. But uh, we need to wait for technology to be getting more mature for this kind of technology. So these are the hydrothermal technologies. Supercritical water gasification, direct liquefaction, and hydrothermal carbonization all of which employs high pressure, high temperature water. And because the pressure, water does not evaporate. Because of the high pressure, you can recover heat. And so that you can make wet biomass to produce gas, liquid, or solid fuels without drying. That's the point of this kind of technology. <coughs> OK, so we discussed these technologies. Oh, we still have flash virus. Now, the, what is flash pyrolysis? This is a technology, one technology for pyrolysis. You are hitting biomass without air. And by heating, you are making the biomass into smaller molecules. When you make it smaller and smaller and smaller, finally you get gas. Without treatment, you have very heavy biomass molecules like starch, cellulose, hemicellulose, lignin, which are polymer, which is also solid. When you decompose it in the middle and stop it here, you can get liquid, uh, which is organic and can be used as fuel. So let's try to stop the reaction here. Not gasification, not carbonization. But how can you stop the reaction here? That point. There have been various studies. When you slowly heat it, some becomes gas rapidly, some becomes carbon, 
and the, the amount of oil is limited. So what they developed is to heat biomass rapidly. And after short reaction time, they cool it rapidly. Then you stop the reaction in the middle to get oil. This is flash pyro technology. Usually they use, it depends, but 400, 600 centigrade. And reaction time is for lower temperature, maybe several seconds. For higher temperature, some 0 0.1 seconds, 0 0.5 seconds, something like that. How can you heat it so rapidly and cool down? What you can use is fluidized bed. You remember what fluidized bed is, right? You have sand, and you send air from the bottom. When the gas velocity is low, gas goes through the particles. But when you increase the gas flow rate, the gas is pushing up the sand. And when it flows, it can move around, and it can transfer heat rapidly, and it can achieve high temperature field here. And then you put biomass here, maybe in the form of powder or something. And then it can be rapidly decomposed here. And once it becomes gas, it is entrained with the gas. And then just within this retention time, it is collected, cooled down, and then it becomes oils. In this way, you can heat biomass rapidly to 400, 600 centigrade. And then the product is treated for 0 0.1, 0 0.5 seconds, and then cool down to correct oil. This flash pyrolysis can produce very dark oil, but it is quite easy. The oil has a heating value of like heavy oil. But unfortunately, it has a large amount of water inside. The actual heat value may be 30 megajoule per kilogram or something. And because it's very dark color, you can burn it, but you can't feed it into the engine. If you want to use further engine fuel, you have to do some upgrade. Maybe you treat it with hydrogen or something. Then you require hydrogen. There are various types of reactors so far developed. This fluidized bed is one of the technology. But another idea was to use some kind of auger reactor. You know auger, right? It is kind of a screw with which biomass is transported. You are feeding biomass and you heat it from outside. And the product gas is rap product oil is rapidly uh, uh, recovered from outside. Another idea was what is called rotating disk. You have a disk which is rotating and heated at high temperature. And then you have biomass. in touch with this. Biomass is heated also by the friction. It gets high temperature and then rapidly liquefied. The oil is collected. This is called abrasive reactor. So there are various technologies. But in any case, you can convert biomass rapidly into oil. That's a good point. Again, this, commercial, this technology is not widely used. If it was commercialized, to my understanding, there were three companies that were producing this oil in Canada. Because Canada has a large amount of wood, they wanted to produce oil, and they could deploy this kind of technology to get oil. 
However, oil is cheap, and they could not make so much money, and it was not widely used. This technology is still under study, and uh, I do not hear so much company that's producing this. But if you want technology there, it was once commercialized. But uh, economical conditions is kind of difficult. Usually, wood is used as a feedstock. It has to be dry. So, now you understand what is flash pyrolysis. So, there are various technologies combustion, pyrolysis, and high thermal conversion, which we have been through. Now, with this, I want to give you some quiz. Yes. Yes. Oops. That's it. Okay. 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 Here. So you can see the problem is this. Consider a biomass species whose moisture content is 90%, so it's wet, and whose heating value is 40 megajoules per kilogram dry. Okay? 40 megajoules per kilogram dry. When this biomass is gasified in supercritical water, one cubic meter of gas was produced for every one kilogram dry of the biomass, and the volume fraction of CO2, CH4, CO, and H2 in the gas were 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.0, and 0 0.3 respectively. Now, I want you to calculate the heating value of this gas. The heating value of each gas, CO2, CH4, CO, H2, are given as 0, 39.7, 12.6, 12.7 joule per cubic meter. And then, what is the cold gas efficiency? You remember the word, right? When we were talking about the high temperature gasification, we discussed cold gas efficiency. Gas at a high temperature has the energy of heat too, but usually gas is used at low temperature, at room temperature. Even at room temperature, it has a value of heating value. So, heating value divided by the feedstock is a cold gas efficiency. And then, when 2.5 megajoule per kilogram H2O of energy is needed to produce one kilogram of supercritical water, so you need some energy, right? And when 90% of this heat is recovered, what is the system efficiency? And when this gas produced for one dry or per day of feedstock provided to gas engine, Whose power generation efficiency is 0 uh, 30 percent? What is electrical power output? So this is a fundamental idea when you have to use this kind of technology. Maybe you have to do it in five years when you go back to your country and introduce this, this technology. So please. Okay, have you got the answer? Let's check the heating value. We have CO2, CH4, CO, and H2. The composition is 0 0.5, 0 0.2, 0 0.0, 0.3. For each gas, one cubic meter gives zero, 
39.7 how much? Uh, 12.6 and 12.7 so how much? this becomes 0 this becomes 7.94 this becomes 0 and this becomes 3.8 1 so in total very good so it is 11.75 megajoule per cubic meter perfect and then what is the code gas efficiency you put 14 right and then you get 11.75 then how much 0 0.8 what what 0 0.8 Yes, 839, around 0.84. But actually, we need some energy to be added here because recovery is not always 100%. We can recover 90%, so 10% has to be given. When you have one kilogram biomass, what is the Weight of water, which is how many kilograms? Yeah, nine kilograms. So one kilogram by mass? No. Just a moment. We're talking about 90% moisture content, right? And we have one kilogram dry of biomass. How much water do we have? Nine kilogram, right? So we have nine kilogram water, which has to be brought up to the supercritical condition. For each kilogram, you need 2.5 megajoule. This is the heat required to produce supercritical water for one kilogram of water. Now we have nine kilogram. You need this heat. This heat is added here. Now, 90% we can recover, but 10% we have to add. So this heat is times 0 0.1. This is heat we have to add. How much? 2.25 megajoule, right? Then, in this case, efficiency, you get 11.75, but how much energy did you put? 14 from biomass and 2.25 from outside to compensate the lost heat. Then, what is the value? How much? 0 0.7 watt. 7? 2, 2. 0 0.723, you agree? 2, 3, okay. So this is the efficiency for this case. OK, and then when you are using one ton per day of this biomass, and you feed this to the 30% gas engine, how much electricity can you get? For one ton, it's 1,000 kilogram, right? For one kilogram, you get this value. And then, this energy is converted to electricity by 30%. Okay? And this is for one day, which is how many seconds? 86400 seconds.
then you can get electric power. How much is it? Hey, who is the first? Who's first? 0 0.04. 0 0.04? Zero point zero four. Zero point zero four. Zero point zero four? Mega? What? Forty? Forty point seven. Kilowatt. Is it, is it true? This and this. This around 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 3, 2, 4. How can it happen? Oh, you're right, you're right. You're right. Okay. So 40 kilowatt. So this is the electricity you can get. Now, okay? You understand everything? With this, now, I hope you learn a lot about this technology. It's a time for that small exam. So you have to wait, okay? Wait for a while. Don't touch. What are you doing? Okay, wait for a while. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. 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 I will measure three minutes. Three, two, one. Zero, please. Okay, it's time. Please give me one seat. Okay, okay, okay. Hey. Okay, okay. One, two, three, and four. Okay, did you get the correct answer? What is the critical temperature of water? Uh, three, seven, yeah, 373. Three. When, you know, what is the favorable field for supercritical water gasification? Wood? Yes. yes. You agree? No. No, right? No, of course not. Palm oil? No. Uh, Palm oil? Chicken no. Chicken manure? Yes. yes. Short residue? Yes. yes. Water has it? It's wet by mass, yes. CDE, okay. And then, what kind of catalyst you use for supercritical gasification? Air? No. no. Metal? Yes. yes. Carbon? Yes. 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 Water? No. no. Alkali? Yes. 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 Okay, what the technology to produce oil from dry biomass by rapid heating and cooling? Flash paris, which is A. What the technology to produce carbonaceous fuel in hot compressed water? Okay, which is D, very good. Okay, so now it's the time for the question now. So please fill in and submit. It's also checking your attendance here. 